Welcome, welcome, welcome. In this video, we're going to discuss the midterm practice. So this is going to be a walkthrough of one example of some random questions that this midterm practice can generate. So it will be different for every time that we you know, try this practice set. So let's see what we're up against. The first problem is on the coin weighing theorems. There's two parts. The first part says that the coin that's counterfeit is slightly heavier. And the next time around, we're told that it's slightly heavier or possibly slightly lighter. So there was two different parts to this theorem. So starting with part A, what we're interested in is powers of three. So if you have three to the power of three, let's just start there, the maximum number of coins you could deal with with three weighings, because three is in the power, is 27. So we'll certainly need four weighings. And the maximum number of coins that we could you know, find the counterfeit among with four weighings would be three to the power of four, which is 81. And the maximum number of weighings that we can find with five weighings would be 81 multiplied by three, which is 243. So we're going to need that sixth weighing to identify our counterfeit coin. So the answer here is six. All right, let's work on part B to this problem. So this time we're given 219 coins and our counterfeit could be either heavier or lighter. So the coin weighing theorem also applies in this case. Just the formula is slightly different. This time we take our power of three we divide by two and we round down to get our threshold. So if we're searching for 219, I might start with maybe three to the power of five, so 243, and I'm gonna take that number and I'm gonna divide by two and round down. So out of that, I get 121. All right, so what does the 121 mean? It means that when we have five weighings, in the case of part B, we can deal with up to 121 coins, but we need 219. So let's try this process one more time. So my next power of three, three to the power of six, so three to the power of six, divided by two and then rounded down, would give me 729 divided by two and rounded down, so that number is 364. So when I have six weighings, I can deal with up to that many coins, so I can certainly deal with 219. So my answer for part B is also six, but for a very different reason than you know, the, the first six that we got. All right, let's move on to the next problem. So question two. Here we're given a power, and we're supposed to find the remainder when we divide by 11. So the first thing that you want to do is take the 37 and reduce it in mod 11. So then we're taking smaller powers. So 37 minus 33 gives me 4 in mod 11. And now I want to search for a pattern with powers of 4. So let's give this a try. So if I have four to the power zero, I get one. Four to the power one, I just get four back. So my search is on, I'm searching for a repeated number with either one or four. So if I keep going, I get 16. And in mod 11, 16 will reduce to five. So four to the power three, I'll do four times five, and that will give me 20. So in mod 11, this time around, I get nine. So on my next step, once again, we'll multiply by four. So four to the power four, nine times four is 36. And if I reduce 36 in mod 11, subtracting 33, I would get three out of the deal. Okay, so four to the power of five, 
would be 4 times 3, which is 12, which gives me 1. So I have found the repeated number that I'm very excited about. So 1 appeared there and 1 appeared again. So when I multiply by 4, I'm going to get the same pattern of 4, 5, 9, 3, 1, 4, 5, 9, 3, over and over and over. So I want to figure out what happens when I go up to the power 169. So if we go all the way up to 169, this pattern is repeating in a cycle of 5. I actually want to reduce 169 in mod 5. So I get 4. And let's be very careful on our page here what congruent symbol applies to which mod. So I'm going to write mod 11 at the end of you know this work that came over here. And then I'm going to write mod 5 at the end of the previous congruence that I just wrote down. Okay, so now I'm searching for the part of my pattern, so my pattern is 1, 4, 5, 9, 3, the part of my pattern that corresponds to powers that are 4 mod 5. So which power is 4 mod 5? So that 4 tells me to correspond right there. So my answer is 3 to this problem. All right, problem number 3. So this problem says that 37 pigeons each choose one of five pigeonholes to fly into. So we have our 37 pigeons and they are choosing five holes. Okay, and we're supposed to fill in the blanks for some statements that talk about or more, and some statements that talk about or less. So the first thing that we're gonna start off by doing is using our trusty old pigeonhole principle. So that says, if we take the number of pigeons, which is 37, and we divide them up by the number of holes, so the average pigeon per hole, if we take that amount, that average, and we round it up, we get a number out of the deal. In this case, our number is eight. And what we can conclude with that number eight is that one hole must have eight or more pigeons. So let's just say it's the first hole, just to give a nice little picture. So we'll say that represents eight or more. So this means that the rest of the holes, so all four of these holes, they must have the other pigeons. So there's 29 or less pigeons that decide to go into those holes. But now the nice thing is we can use the pigeonhole principle all over again in the same manner that we just did and make a similar conclusion. We can now think of 29 pigeons being distributed into four holes. And we'll think about the or less statement that would come out of the deal so 29 over 4 rounded up, this expression gives me 21. So that tells me that out of the three holes that are remaining down here, that there is 21 or less pigeons. And finally, we can get a conclusion that if there's 21 or less down in those three, then up here in the remaining two holes, the rest of them must exist. So it's 16 or more. So these provide our answers. So one of the holes has eight or more pigeons. Two of the five holes have a combined total of 16 or more pigeons. Four of the five holes have 29 or less. And three of the five have 21 or less. Now, there is one more thing that we should verify. The question also wants us to make sure that the numbers that we plugged in up top here are the largest possible, and the numbers that we plugged in down here are the smallest possible. So one way to view this is to distribute the pigeons among the holes evenly. So you'd get like 8, 8, and then a 7, and then a 7. So you can see that this number here 
is the largest that we can possibly write, we can't write 9 there because it may not be the case that 9 pigeons flew into one of the holes. But we can verify by the pigeonhole principle that this statement here is indeed correct, that we can guarantee one of the holes has 8 or more. And we can't necessarily guarantee that two holes have 17 or more, because it could be like this case right here, and 16 becomes the largest possible number that you can plug in there to make the statement true. Similarly, with 29 or less, if you look at this amount here, that's exactly that threshold. That is 29 or less. And we can't put a number that's any smaller in there, because then there is an example, a counterexample, where you'd have a case where no combination of four holes has 28 or less. Similarly, 7 and 7 and 7 give you 21, showing us that 21 or less pigeons is the smallest number that we can plug in here, because if you plug in any smaller, 20 or less pigeons in three holes, that might not occur, as that example shows. So all of that said, for the last minute or so, we can kind of trust that the pigeonhole principle is giving us the uh, threshold number anyway. It's giving us the largest possible numbers that we can plug in for the or more statements and the smallest possible numbers that we can plug in for the or less statements anyway. All right, let's take a look at the next problem. All right, so this problem is called difference of 10. So true or false, in every way of selecting 21 different integers from 1 to 32, there exists two integers that differ by 10. So here we would like to use the pigeonhole principle once again. And we're going to start by writing down some differences of 10. So we can have 1 and 11, and we could have 2 and 12, we could have 3 and 13, 4 and 14, on and on and on. Eventually, maybe we'll get you know, 10 and 20. And then, once we hit the number 21, well, that will match up with a difference of 11 as well. So numbers that are side by side are representing differences of 10. So continue on, we'd have 22 and 23, 24 and 30, and then 31 and 32. So if we think of these as our pigeon holes, where each row represents one hole, we can see that out of 21, we must have three pigeons landing in the same hole. So if these pigeons land down here in a hole of size three, we definitely have you know, three numbers that you know, give us at least one pair that differs by 10. If the numbers land up here, even if you're getting three numbers, it doesn't really matter which choice you make. No matter what, if you chose those ones, these ones would be side by side. If you chose these three here, then you have you know, two choices for numbers that are side by side. No matter how you spread out the numbers, three numbers out of four, you're going to get two that are side by side, representing a difference of 10. So the answer to the problem is true. All right, let's take a look at the next problem. So question five gives us the game of Nim. So in this game, we're given rows. You can take whatever you want from a given row. And your objective is to pick up the last counter, as long as you're just taking an amount from one row at a time. Players alternate in this way. So there's a nim sum to a game of nim. So we're going to find that right now. So if we take 8 
and we nim sum it with 12, and we nim sum it with 3, and we nim sum it with 5. The idea is to take these numbers and write them out as powers of 2. 8 is all set already. 12 is 8 plus 4. 3 can be written as 2 plus 1, and 5 can be written as 4 plus 1. So these are all now powers of 2. We cross out any pairs that we see. Pairs come two at a time. So what's left over happens to be 2. Our nim sum is 2. So which player can always win this game? Well, anytime you have a non-zero nim sum, the first player can win. And in how many different ways can that first player win? So what you want to do is search for the largest power in the nim sum, the largest power of 2 in the nim sum, which is 2 to the power 1 in our case. This number right here is just 2. So the largest power in the number 2 is 2. And then you search through all of your rows and you search for how many times does the number 2 appear. Well, it appears once. So this means that there is one way to follow a winning strategy. That would be on the row that contains the number 3. Row 3 happens to contain three counters. So then the question goes on to say, if the first player chooses row 3 for their first move, we know now that that's the only choice that they had, how many counters should they take from that particular row? So what we want to do here is take the nim sum, which happens to be 2, so we take s and we nim sum it with row 3. So the amount that's in row 3 happens to be 3. So out of this, we get 1. That result is 1, and that tells us how many counters to leave in row 3. So the old row 3 is 3, and the new row 3, it must be 1. So this means that the number of counters that we want to take from row 3 should be 2. All right, next problem. Our next problem is classic NIM. So similar to NIM, classic NIM has the same rules in terms of the structure of what you do on each of your turns, except this time around, the last player that plays and you know, takes counters in this game will end up losing the game. So it has the opposite winning condition. It turns out that classic NIM and regular NIM have the same winning strategy, except when you get down to a case like, show, like it's, it's shown right in front of us here, where we have just one big row. So a big row is anything with more than one counter, and row four happens to be that big row. And the strategy, when you have just one big row, changes from the nim sum strategy to something different, and that something different is to leave an odd amount of ones left over. So which player can always win? Well, the first player can, again, follow this winning strategy that we're talking about and always win. How many different ways can they choose their move? Well, there's just one big row and we have to act on that big row. So there's just one way to follow that winning strategy. So if we choose row four for our uh, winning move, how many should we take? Well, we want to take all 10 to follow the winning strategy. All right, let's move on to problem number seven, the matchstick game. Ooh, I like this number. So from a pile of Connor McDavid matchsticks, two players take turns either removing one or four sticks. The player that removes the last one is the winner. So this is a, a NIM style game. Now we can't use the NIM sum for this problem because it is a different game. The NIM sum is re reserved to just the game of NIM. But what we can do is employ our use of a partial state diagram. So the way that we want to employ our use of the partial state diagram is to look at the end of the game and apply hot and cold positions 
to figure out who can always win this game. Now we don't want to write down 97 positions, but hopefully we can notice a pattern to see what's occurring. So maybe if we start with the question that says in part A, 10 matchsticks, that will give us a, a clue as to what's going on. So we can either take one or four sticks. So one plus four is five. That gives me a hint to write down the remainders when we divide by five. So four, three, two, one, and zero. And I'm gonna write down another column just like that. So five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. Now let's see if we can assign hot and cold positions. So if you have one, you can just take that one to win the game, follow a winning strategy, and that will identify that zero should be a cold position. So if you have two left, you're forced to just take one. You can't take four at that point. You can only take one or four. So there's no winning strategy. So two is cold, which makes three hot. Everything you can do is just play to two and you'll end up winning from there. And from four, you can also follow a winning strategy by taking four. So when you have four counters, you certainly don't want to take one. That would be a poor choice. So what about five? So from five, you can change to either a one or a four. Now, all of those choices are hot, and that's what makes a cold position. So five is cold. Now from six, you can play into five. So that makes six hot. Now from seven, you can either take one or four. And if you take one, you end up in a hot position of six. And if you take four, you end up in a hot position of three. So every way of playing out of seven is hot, and that makes seven cold, which in turn makes eight hot because you can play into seven. And nine has been sort of known to be hot this whole time because you could play into five. So nine is a hot position. And similarly, we get 10 being cold. You can either play to six or nine. Both of those are hot. So from 11, you can play into 10. So 11 is hot. 14 can play into 10. So 14 is also hot. From 12, you can either play to 11 or eight. Both of those are hot. All the choices from 12 are hot, making 12 cold. And that makes 13 hot. On and on and on. Hopefully at this point where you're tired of this process, we can see that the pattern repeats in a cycle of five. So what I wanna do is find my remainders of the numbers that are given in mod five. So 10 reduces to zero in mod five. So that tells me that my answer is cold for 10. So cold. When I have 17 matchsticks remaining, again, I'll reduce in mod five and I get two. So with two, I can look and notice that two, that row in my sequence here is also a cold position. So again, I end up with cold for part B. So finally, in the case of 97 matchsticks, 97, it turns out that that also reduces to two in mod five. So it just so happens that the random number generator here generated me all cold positions. Which player can always win this game? Well, when there's 97 matchsticks at the start, then the second player can always win. And if we happen to get uh, numbers that reduce to four, three, or one in mod five, then uh, hot positions would appear. Let's take a look at problem number eight. All right, in the next problem, we are discussing the ISBN 10. 
So in the ISBN 10, we multiply all of the digits by the consecutive numbers from 1 to 10. Okay, so there's my uh, pairing of the coefficients to multiply by. And we want to make sure that when you add up all of these numbers, multiply by the coefficients, you always get 0 in mod 11. So let's write down our congruence. We have y multiplied by 10 plus 2 multiplied by 9, so 18, and then plus 3 multiplied by 8, so 24, and then 7 multiplied by 4, so 28, and then 6 multiplied by 5, which is 30. And then maybe something kind of nice happens here with these numbers. We're noticing that they kind of pair up, the 2 and then the 9 and the 3 and the 8, the 4 and the 7, 5 and the 6. They all pair up. So how about we take everything that we just wrote down and multiply by 2 to save us the next um, you know, four steps. And then there will be a plus 4 times 1 on the end. These numbers that we just wrote down should all add up to 0 in mod 11. So let's reduce in mod 11. So nothing we can do with the 10y at the moment. Let's reduce 18. 18 is 4 less than 22, so minus 4. 24 is 2 more than 22. 28 is 6 more than 22. And 30 is 3 less than 33. Okay, so everything inside of the brackets boils down to 8 minus 7, which is just 1. So we have 10y plus 2 times 1 plus 4, which is plus 6. And if we want to uh, solve this for 0 in mod 11, we'll move the uh, 6 to the other side. So we get minus 6. And we can also write 10 as minus 1. So we'll write minus y instead of 10y. And then finally, y would be congruent to 6 by multiplying both sides by minus 1. So mod 11 is the congruence that we were solving this one in. So the missing digit y happens to be 6 this time around. Now maybe a, a beware before we move on to the next problem. In this particular case, uh, 10 changed into minus 1. So the inverse of 10 was 10 itself, because the inverse of minus 1 is minus 1. In a different case, you might have to you'll find the inverse of this number, and it might not be quite as uh, clear as just changing it into minus 1. The random numbers just led us to you know, this particular case this time around. Okay, question 9, the camper's problem. So this one should look familiar. The problem is worded very similar to something you may have seen before. The counselor is trying to find the camp but has campers with them that might be lying. So this particular version of the problem says that 11 of them sometimes lie. So what is the smallest number of campers that could be with the counselor if there's these three paths to explore because the counselor will explore one of them if 11 of them sometimes lie? So the good news is we can go to a result that we've already discussed with this problem. That result said that 3n plus 2 is the minimum number of campers that you need when n of them sometimes lie. So 3 times 11 plus 2 will give us 33 plus 2, so 35 in total. And reviewing the campers problem, in how we actually send the campers down the individual paths. Once the counselor checks a path, there's three paths remaining, and the idea is to divide these campers up evenly 
among the remaining paths. So we're supposed to report our answer so that uh, path one is bigger than or equal to path two and bigger than or equal to path three. So we should write uh, 12 and 12 and 11. Okay, so there's one last problem that's been generated for us here. The secret number problem. It reads, I'm thinking of an integer from 0 to 15. You may ask me to write that digit in binary. I will use four digits to write out that number in binary. And then ask the following seven questions. My answer is given below. However, I may have lied once. Which question, if any, was answered with a lie? What number am I thinking of in binary, and what number am I thinking of in decimal? So that's thinking of without the lie. I'm thinking of an actual number, but I might lie to you, is what the secret number person is saying. So the idea behind this type of problem is to use the Hamming code. So let's write down our format of our Hamming code. So the rightmost digit in binary is a one. Yes. So that is corresponding to question one. And then the next digit is a no corresponding to zero and then no and then no again. So corresponding questions written above are and then we'll write in the check digits for our Hamming code. So A, B, and C will represent the columns for our check digits and corresponding to question five, six, and seven. So question five said, yes, there's an odd number of ones in the second, third, and fourth position. So second goes right there, third is right there, and fourth is right there. Question six, no, there is not an odd number of ones in the first, third, and fourth positions. And finally, question seven, no, there is not a number, an odd number of ones in the first, second, and fourth positions. Now that we have this set up, we can follow the correction for the Hamming code. So that tells us that we should have an odd number of ones underneath all of the letters. So underneath the A, we have one one. So the A's are problematic. There's some problem, some kind of lie underneath the A's. Under the Bs, if we check, we have one, one, one underneath the Bs. So there's also a problem underneath the Bs, some kind of lie underneath the Bs. And underneath the Cs, we count one as well. So there is a problem underneath the As, Bs, and Cs. So this column contains the issue. So the correction would be one, zero, zero, one for the correct number in binary. So right here, we would fill that question four is a lie. The four digit number in binary that we're thinking of is one, zero, zero, one. And the integer that corresponds to that in decimal would be eight plus zero plus zero plus one. So it's the number nine. Thanks so much for listening all the way to the end. Best of luck on the actual midterm. We'll see you on the next one.